Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. I hope you had a great week. Before we start, like always, remember that Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Tuning Radio, Overcast, Pandora, whatever you listen to your podcast, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1. So please go ahead and follow. When I post the episodes, I always post like a picture of an organism, an auger. So pretty good picture, so go ahead and follow. So on our last episode, we talked about the urea test, right? So we've been going over tests that you can use for gram-negative rods. We started with the triple sugar iron or the TSI. Then we went on to the LIA, lysine iron agar. And then we talked about the urea test. So the urea test, it is used to determine the organism's ability to produce the enzyme urease, which hydrolyzes urea. It is an agar test, right? So it contains urea. And once again, we have phenol red as a pH indicator. You remember that phenol red was the pH indicator on the TSI or the triple sugar iron when as a product of fermentation, acid was produced, and then the medium changed color. So this differ from the LIA, the lysine iron agar, where the pH was pH indicator was the bromocresyl purple. So now on the urea test, we have the phenol red as a pH indicator again. So we talked about how the test works and we got a little technical, right? So first we need to understand what's urea and that's the product of the decarboxylation of amino acids. So basically when urea is hydrolyzed, ammonia and CO2 or carbon dioxide are produced. So ammonia brings the medium to an alkaline pH. So when this happens, there's phenol red. So at an alkaline pH of 8.1, the medium changes to a magenta color. So a positive reaction is the pink color, and a negative is no color change. And we talked about degrees of positivity. So some rapid urease producers, they can change the medium from two to six hours. But then it can take up to 24 hours. Sometimes, you know, you can have several days before the medium changes. And then if you don't, the organism does not produce urease, you know, which is the enzyme that hydrolyzes urea, then there is no color change. So def- different degrees. And I have talked about that. You know, you should, you put the test in the, in the incubator from 18 to 24 hours. I have seen it that on the bench, without the incubator, it changes. If it's a strong uh, urease producer, it will change very rapid. But then you put it in the incubator. And as we went along with this test, we continue talking about some of the differences. You know, I mentioned the pH indicator. So I also talked about the stab and streak technique, right? So you stab the butt, and as you go up and pull your needle, then you streak the slant. So with the urease test, the urea test, you don't stab the button. You just streak the slant and that's it. And I, am, I mentioned that you do this because that's your control. You want to make sure that you're observing. So you see the negative on the same test. So that's one of the differences between TSI, LIA, and urea. On the other two, you do the stab and streak. And on this one, it is just the streak only on the slanted portion. So we also mentioned that with the urease test, and that we you know that urea agar, unlike TSI and your LIA, which is used for gram-negative rods, this one you can use it for gram-negative rods. Like we mentioned, Proteus, it can aid in the identification of Proteus. Proteus is positive for this test. It can also be used, for example, if you're trying to distinguish between a Klebsiella pneumoniae and a Klebsiella aerogenes, that you had a low discrimination on the Vitec, you can use this test. 
However, you can also use it for other organisms. Like for example, you can use it for gram-positive rods. And I talked about Corynebacterium urolyticum, which you can encounter them in, encounter it in the urine bench. It is a known uh, uropathogen. It has pinpoint colonies, which differs from the other dipteroids or corniform gram-positive rods that tend to be skin flora, non-pathogenic. So this one is like the colonies are pinpoint. So I said that if you get a pure growth of this organism, you should do this test to make sure that you uh, rule out Corynebacterium urolyticum. And then I also mentioned for that this test can be used, for example, in the it aids in the identification of brucella, which is a gram-negative cocobacilli, that it can be transmitted from animals. And this is a very serious organism because it can be transmitted via aerosol particles. It can be used in potential terror attacks. And it's an intracellular organism. So it can go inside the white blood cells. So bottom line, this is a very useful test. So keep that in mind. Not only helps with gram-negative rods, but it also helps with other organisms like that like that gram-negative cocobacilli brucella and coronavacterium urolyticum. Now, up to this point in the podcast, by the way, thank you for the support, for all the downloads. If you listen to it, just please tell more of your friends. Hey, go ahead and listen to Let's Talk Micro. So at this point in time, we have covered tests and biochemicals for gram-positive cocci gram-positive rods, and gram-negative rods. So today I want to start talking about gram-negative cocci or diplococci. Which biochemicals do we have for them? First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, let's start thinking what are examples of gram-negative diplococci. Well, one of the most common ones, right, is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is transmitted sexually, can be transmitted sexually. So it's a sexually transmittable disease or STD. So the patient has painful urination, you go to the doctor, they do, they collect urine, um, and then, you know, normally they do a PCR on it, and they said you have gonorrhea. So another example is Moraxella cateralis, and I'll be talking about Moraxella cateralis today. So it's a gram-negative diplococci, and what are diplococci? Well, uh, there are two cocci together with the adjacent sides flattened. We're getting technical. They're often referred to as kidney or coffee bean shape. And you should always be careful when you are on the bench with the diplococci based on the source. Because, right, if you're calling gram negative diplococci, the physician can start thinking about maybe there's gonorrhea, maybe there's Neisseria meningitis even more axilla cateralis, depending on the source. So you want to make sure that if you're seeing it, if you're not too sure, at the very least, get a more experienced technologist or get your supervisor to take a look at them, especially when you have blood, blood cultures and you know significant sources like that, like spinal fluid. You want to be careful with them. In other, in other sources like sputum, you don't have to be as careful because we do have like a non-pathogenic Neisseria in our respiratory area. So there you definitely feel more comfortable calling them because they are there. They're part of the respiratory flora. So, like I said, we have two cocci. Their sides are flattened and they can be referred to as kidney or coffee bean shape. So Moraxella cateralis. What's Moraxella cateralis? Well, as normal flora of the upper respiratory tract, it can be spread from the patient's endogenous strain to normally sterile sites. So you can have transmission of respiratory droplets, and most infections, they're localized to sites that are associated with the respiratory tract. For example, otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia. One fact about Moraxella is that you have those colonies that they can slide around the agar, right? All of you technologists out there, 
and uh, maybe on the students too, they're thinking, okay, oh, I know this. So go ahead and say it. It is called the hockey puck. So you touch the colonies on the outer and this, they slide around. So I was doing some reading. So the manual of the clinical microbiology of the ASM, which is the American Society of Microbiology, says that Moraxella catarralis is now regarded as a human mucosal pathogen. So probably as we go along, the textbooks will get updated. But this is what the manual says. So like I said, for Moraxella, there's a, a, it is found in the respiratory tract. So when you are doing a sputum gram stain, which the texts always tend to be, they don't like them a lot. Maybe because, I don't know, they don't like the fact that if you, like I like to say, that if you have many epithelial cells, you have to reject them. I mean, that's not always the case. Like if you have babies, if it's the second time uh, that this happens, you know, there's a ratio between white blood cells and epithelial cells from the gram stain that you have to see. So if you have a certain amount, you have to reject it. You have to reject the sputum culture and request a recollect. And of course, if you have an outpatient, a baby, you don't do that. But bottom line, a lot of technologies, they don't like dealing with sputum gram stain. But they're beautiful. There are, there's so much bacteria in your sputum. You know, you have so much normal respiratory flora that a sputum gram stain is like a quality control slide. It's just beautiful. You have your cocci, you can have them in clusters, you can have them in chains. You have gram positive rods, you can have a degree of, you know, can have some gram negative rods, can see gram negative cocobacilli, can see yeast, and then you can see gram negative diplococci. So it is a beautiful slide where you can see everything. Sometimes, you know, depending on the situation, you can even see gram positive rods that are beaded, you know, which like indicates nocardia. So it's, it's a great slide to look at. So like I said, so you can definitely see diplococci there. And since I mentioned that you can see more axilla cateralis on otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia. It has been my experience that I see it a lot on, not a lot, but when I mostly see it, especially in a pure growth, it has been on sinus cultures. So... Normally, we tend to see a lot of staph epidermidis on sinus cultures. And then when I have seen a, a pure growth of Moraxella, it is, you see it on a, on, on a sinus culture. So you see those white colonies, you touch them around, they slide around the auger, and then you do the cateralis test, which is what I'm going to be talking about. So what's the cateralis disc or test? Well, it is a test to detect the enzyme butyrate esterase, B-U-T-Y-R-A-T-E, esterase. This aids in the identification of Moraxella cateralis. So this organism has an enzyme called butyrate esterase, which releases indoxyl from indoxyl butyrate. This produces an indigo color in the presence of oxygen. It's a very simple test. You get the disc and place it on a slide. Then you apply your colonies using a wooden stick. A positive color is a blue color developed within two minutes. A negative color is no color change. So keep in mind that you have to make sure that what you place on the disc, I mean like what the organism that you place on that disc is actually a gram negative diplococci. Otherwise, you know, you can get a false positive result. But this is true for everything you do in the lab. I mean, you cannot assume, like I like to say, that just because you have white colonies that are not growing on McConkie, you have a gram positive cocci, you have a coag negative staph. You have to take the time to do the gram stain. And of course, you know, you get proficient enough that you see it many times. I mean, this is what micro is all about, repetition. So you see these colonies, and then you recognize the morphology, and you get comfortable. But you should always try to do a gram stain. Such a simple test 
and it points you in the right direction, right? White colonies could be cocci, could be yeast, could be gram positive rods. So that depends on the source, might be skin flora. You might have to work it up. So you should always know what you have before you actually perform a test, right? Sometimes, and we'll talk about the Vitek down the line, but yeah, you sometimes if you put a gram positive rod, thinking that it's a gram positive cocci on a gram positive ID card, you can get cocuria, which cocuria a lot of times is a false ID when you set up the wrong organism. The same thing happens when you set something that is not a gram negative run on a gram negative ID card on the Vitek. You know, you get sphingomonas. You know, yes, sphingomonas is a gram negative run. It's oxidase positive. But a lot of times that's like the default ID when you set the wrong organism on that card. So you always have to be careful with this. So with the cataralysis test, make sure that you have a gram negative diplococci when you're performing this test. So now that we talked about this test, does it remind you of another test that we did in a previous episode? Well, if you're th thinking about the microdase disc, you are correct. It's, you know, they have different principles, of course, but the way that you set up the test, it's the same. You get a uh, disc, you place it on a slide, then you grab a stick, grab your colony, you know, you place it on that disc and then you observe for a color reaction, right? So with the microdase, it tends to be a purple color for a positive. And then with, for this test, it's a bluish color for your positive. So it's, it's, they're very similar the way that you set them up. And of course, with the microdase, you have to make sure that you have a gram positive cocci when you're doing this test. So for this case, you have to make sure you have a gram-negative diplococci when you are performing this test. So why is this test so useful? Well, and I know you're thinking now in the Malditov age, it might not be so useful, but this is something that you can perform on the bench right away and you can call your organism. Whereas with the Malditov, depending on, normally, a Malditov is a very expensive instrument, right? So if you have it, that means that your facility is probably very large. So you have a lot of techs setting up Molotov at the same time. So one slide, which each spot where you set up an organism, so you can have a, a total of three acquisitions with 16 spots each. So that's a total of 48 IDs that the instrument has to produce. And that's not without counting the calibration, which is right on the center, which is a strain of E. coli. But we'll talk about more about the Molotov down the line. So this can be time consuming. And if you have a lot of cultures to get through, if you have a full slide of 48 organisms that you place there, it can take an hour. And that's providing that your instrument is working optimally. So with this, you don't have to wait for anyone else to set up their slide. You don't have to wait in line. You grab this disc and then in two minutes you're done. And that's it. So it provides a presumptive ID for more Excel cataralysis. So that means that you don't have to further identify it by another commercial method. And like I keep saying, we'll have an episode with presumptive IDs. So you're on the bench. You see large colonies that slide around the agar. You do a gram stain, and it is a gram negative diplococci. So then, now that you know that it's a gram negative diplococci, you go ahead and perform this di this test. You know, grab your disc, put your colonies on, wait those two minutes, and then you see that blue color. Then you can report it as Moraxella cataralis. So it is definitely a widely used test in the lab. So yeah, and then you can actually finalize the culture. I mean, you typically don't do susceptibilities on a Moraxella cataralis. You will do um, a beta-lactamase test, which is a, you do like a cephinase test, which is for beta-lactamase production. And as you know, beta-lactamase, it can affect if, if this enzyme is produced, 
it can offer resistance to certain antibiotics. But we'll talk more about that down the line. You know, you as a student out there don't need to focus so much on on antibiotics. You know, this is something that you will learn more on the job. I think that as you're studying, make sure that you know your reactions. Make sure you know your organisms. Start associating the organism with the disease. And telltale signs of the particular organisms. And this will help you do well in school. And not only that, make sure you pass your certification boards. I don't know how does it work in other countries. And hopefully, as we bring international guests, uh, we'll clarify more on that. But at least in the U.S., you know, you have to have a license. You have to have a certification to work, depending on the state. You need more than one. Like you have the ASCP, which is the American Society for Clinical Pathology. And that works in all the states. And then depending on which state you have, you also have to have a state license. Like Florida is one of them. So when you get here, um, you have to apply for it. And you don't need to take a test. I mean, they will accept your ASCP in lieu of a test. The same thing with other certifications. Like the, um, Amer- the AMT, American Medical Technologist. That's another one. So knowing these organisms and their reactions and those telltale signs, it will definitely help you out. So don't focus a lot on antibiotics. But as I was saying with the Moraxella, you typically don't do susceptibilities. You just do the cephanase test for beta lactamase production, which is probably going to be positive, And then you report like that. Moraxella cateralis, beta lactamase positive, depending on what result you get. And that's it. So to connect that with you students out there, you know, I mentioned the telltale signs. Normally, when you aren't getting tested, let it be in school or let it be for a certification exam, you know, you get case studies. They give you scenarios about a patient doing something. They go to the hospital and then they get the organism. They say the culture produced this. So when they're saying gram stain, gram, so a good scenario could be Let's say a 25-year-old male with sinusitis goes to the hospital, a culture is performed, and then you have gram-negative diplococci that slide around the colonies or a hockey puck movement. So you're already thinking more axilla cateralis. So start associating these things, and it will definitely help you do well on your exam. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. We got through another one. I hope you enjoyed listening about the Cateralis disc and more Axella, because as always, I sure enjoy talking about it. Continue staying safe. Continue staying motivated. Continue bringing that passion. And I, I cannot stress that enough. Over with this pandemic, Healthcare workers have been so stressed out. We have been overwhelmed at times, a lot of times, with so much COVID testing, the increase in patients in our hospitals, losses, so many things. So it's so important to continue bringing that motivation into work. It will help you be at your best. That way, the best outcome for the patient is ensured that we produce that great ID, that great susceptibility, and the patient can get treated and be better, which is why we do this. It's for the patients. So once again, stay safe, stay motivated, stay passionate, and of course, continue talking micro. Until next time, have a good one.